755 billionaires in the entire world, meaning that only one in every 2.8 million people reach the elusive 10-figure mark. Given the extreme difficulty of the task, it's not surprising that most billionaires spend their entire careers working towards 10 figures, with the average billionaire taking 21 years to reach the mark. Even the most notable billionaires in history, including Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, and Elon Musk, took over a decade to make their first billion. One entrepreneur named Jay Walker, however, managed to accomplish this feat within just 12 months, which is the fastest in history. So here's how Jay Walker made $1 billion in one year. Taking a look back, Jay Walker was born to an immigrant family on November 5, 1955 in Queens, New York. His mother's family had fled to New York from Germany right before the start of World War II. Meanwhile, his father's side of the family had lived in the US for a few generations and even made some good money during the Roaring Twenties. From a very young age, Jay found himself embarking on endeavor after endeavor, trying to make a bit of money here and there. He sold candles, seeds, and jelly door to door, and he delivered newspaper to his community. As he grew older, Jay became even more involved in the community, joining student government. Nowadays, student government is more or less just a resume patter. But back in the day, it seems like Jay actually played a pretty active role in the community. One time, he was the student representative in a debate between a teacher's union and the city of Yonkers during a funding crisis. Anyway, Jay ended up graduating from high school in 1973, and he would go on to attend Cornell University, where he majored in industrial relations. Jay later revealed that the motivation behind getting this degree was to hopefully score a spot as an assistant to an extremely wealthy individual. Jay strongly believed that understanding how wealthy people operated was essential in becoming wealthy himself. Jay didn't stick around at college for too long though, as he would drop out and try to start a business. Unfortunately though, this didn't go too well. Jay started a free weekly newspaper in Ithaca, New York. Things started off great, as Jay quickly grew to 175 employees with 25,000 newspapers in circulation. However, his business would crumble when the local daily paper company came out with their own weekly newspaper. Jay shut down his newspaper business and returned to college shortly after. But now, he had $150,000 in debt, or $675,000 today. Jay would graduate in 1977 and get a job at a magazine company called Folio after college. He worked on the marketing side for Folio for about 4 years, before he quit and tried to start another company called Visual Technologies Corporation. The company sold glass sculptures that emitted light whenever someone touched them. While these sculptures had some novelty, they didn't really serve much of a purpose. Jay also quickly found out that the sculptures were extremely expensive to manufacture. Just a few years after starting the company, Visual Technologies Corporation would file for bankruptcy in 1986, having lost a painful $5.3 million. Jay didn't quit though, he instantly switched to running another business called Cadillac Media Corporation. Jay partnered with Transworld Airlines to offer discounted flight tickets to readers of the catalog. Jay actually managed to sell a large amount of discounted tickets. However, there was a problem. Jay had been selling the discounted tickets to travel agents as opposed to end consumers, which was in violation of the contract with Transworld Airlines. Transworld Airlines would sue Cadillac Media Corporation, and this company would also be shut down in 1988. At this point, Jay was only 33 years old, but he had already run three businesses into the ground, losing millions of dollars and destroying his credit. Nonetheless, Jay still wasn't ready to give up. In 1991, Jay would form a joint venture with one of his biggest investors over the years, Michael Loeb. This business was called New Sub Services, and it specialized in selling magazine subscriptions through credit card companies. The company didn't skyrocket or anything, but for the first time in Jay's career, the company also didn't shut down. In fact, this company is still around 30 years later, and they go by the name Synapse Group. They employ about 170 people today, so nothing super insane, but also nothing to scoff at. Jay could have just stuck around at Synapse Group and he would have done extremely well, but Jay had even larger ambitions. So in 1995, he would start yet another company called Walker Digital. Jay was a massive fan of Thomas Edison and he wanted this company to basically be a digital version of Thomas Edison's laboratory. At first, Jay dabbled with some software that could be used in restaurants, but soon enough, Jay would land on his billion dollar idea, buyer driven pricing. Buyer driven pricing is when consumers tell companies how much they're willing to pay for a service or product, and then the companies will do business with customers with reasonable offers. This business model was especially attractive within the airline industry. 
Consumers wanted discounted airline tickets, and airlines were often willing to get rid of empty seats for below market prices. Spotting this massive opportunity, Jay went ahead and applied for a patent for the business model. And fun fact, this was the first time that the US Patent Office granted a patent for a business method. After receiving his patent, Jay founded a company called Priceline.com in April of 1998. Jay partnered with a plethora of different airlines, but despite that, during their first year of operation, only about 7% of customers were actually able to buy a ticket through Priceline. Honestly though, this wasn't that big of a deal. If you were planning on traveling somewhere, you could make a bid for a flight ticket on Priceline. If you were lucky, you'd get a discounted ticket. If not, you can just buy a ticket at market price. In other words, there was no reason to not give Priceline a shot, and this made Priceline extremely popular amongst consumers. Despite this monumental demand, Priceline was losing a lot of money. But investors were more than happy to back internet companies at the time, their financial shortfall wasn't that big of a deal. In April of 1999, one year after founding the company, Jay took Priceline public, and as you would guess, the stock exploded. Priceline ran up to a valuation of $11.8 billion, and Jay's stake ballooned up to $5.2 billion. Jay had finally made it as an entrepreneur, and so he decided to celebrate. Jay bought himself a third Mercedes, and he started construction on his dream mansion. Jay didn't get complacent though, he continued to aggressively expand Priceline. For example, Jay worked quite hard to get actor William Shatner on board. At first, William didn't even want to meet with Jay. So, Jay agreed to pay William to have a meeting with him. During the meeting though, William would become so impressed with Jay that he agreed to do the ads for stock compensation as opposed to cash compensation. Jay also tried to expand the business model to groceries and gas as well with the launch of Priceline Webhouse. Though there was a large amount of demand from consumers for the service, the logistics of running this business were a nightmare. But little did Jay know that this was the least of his concerns. In early 2000, the dot-com bubble burst and valuations of all internet and tech companies fell off a cliff. Jay wasn't phased by the crash though. He was like, I'll just buy the dip at these discounted prices and hold until the stock recovers. Unfortunately though, Jay wasn't buying the dip. He was buying a downtrend. To make things even worse, 9-11 would kill consumer demand for airline tickets and this would push Jay over the edge. At the end of 2001, Jay would shut down Priceline Webhouse and sell his entire stake to Hong Kong investors. In retrospect, Jay literally sold at the bottom. I'm really not sure why he did this. He could have sold when he was down 50, 60, even 80% and he could have still walked away a billionaire. But instead, he decided to sell when he was down 94%. On the bright side, this still came out to about $333 million after taxes. But when you're down 94%, you might as well weather out the storm and stage your recovery. I know that's easy to say in hindsight, but many entrepreneurs like Jeff Bezos and Steve Jobs did exactly that. Given the resilience Jay showed in the 70s and 80s by starting business after business, this decision is quite confusing. But whatever the reasoning, this is what Jay ended up choosing. Anyway, after the dot-com crash, Priceline stock didn't really move for another 5 years. Priceline started to make a recovery in 2006 and 2007, but they got crushed once again by the 2008 financial crisis. It wasn't until 2009 that Priceline really started to grow once again, but they haven't looked back since then. In the 2010s, Priceline went on a buying spree, acquiring everyone from Kayak and OpenTable to hotels combined and Venga. At the end of 2013, Priceline finally broke out of their dot-com peak and they have over doubled since then. In 2018, the Priceline group changed their name to Booking Holdings and now they sit at a valuation of $94 billion with a total of 19,400 employees. Jay had a 35% stake in the company and even if we say that stake was watered down to 20%, Jay would be worth a little under $20 billion today if he had held on. After leaving Priceline, Jay returned to Walker Digital and he's been working there ever since. As we previously discussed, Walker Digital is more of a research company as opposed to a consumer business. So, Walker Digital mainly works in the background, licensing technology and inventions to other companies like Time Warner. Given that Walker Digital does not sell any products themselves, many consider the company to be a patent troll. And given that Jay Walker is the 10th most patented living inventor today, I don't think that title is necessarily inaccurate. Today, Jay Walker is estimated to be worth about $500 million, 
So, it doesn't look like Jay ever recovered the money he lost during the dot-com crash, but I don't really think he even cares to do so. At the end of the day, Jay was able to go from zero to over a billion dollars within a single year thanks to the explosive success of Priceline combined with the dot-com bubble. Though most of Jay's wealth was made within an extremely short period of time, the truth is that Priceline's success was a culmination of decades of repeatedly starting businesses, failing, and trying again nonetheless. So, I personally think Jay's eventual success was well-deserved, even though there was a good amount of luck mixed in with his final rise. Do you guys agree? Comment that down below.